Thanks for checking out a message. Here at Centerpoint, our goal is to be positive, relevant, and real, and help you take the next step in your relationship with God. Enjoy! As we are about halfway through our newer series, maybe it's newer, maybe it's not, uh, but it's called I Blank Today. And I mean, most of us know we are in a season where people want your vote, right? <laughs> or participation. <laughs> um, but voting is this beautiful right and freedom that we have as Americans to vote for our leader and to have a say in it. And I think God is all for it. And it's important to not take this right for granted. But we discussed these past two weeks that it is not the utmost importance. I've quoted a very traditional pastor, John Piper, who says it this way, voting, it is one possible good deed alongside many others, one way of serving the good of society, but there are too many other factors at stake to describe it as an absolute duty. He describes voting as a good deed, an act of us kind of contributing to help the greater good, which is just beautiful, and we should participate in it, but as Christians, our good deeds aren't what living is all about, and it's definitely not about showing favoritism with a culturally popular deed over others. When Jesus was asked specifically, what's the most important thing to do as in deed or thing to act upon, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So Jesus' emphasis was on the deed of loving God as priority number one, which is what last week's message was all about. We need to ensure that we worship God first because our worship isn't just attending a Sunday service or church, but true worship is with our life. It's with our time and our money and our pride and surrendering these things to God and his will and direction, which when you do this, it ultimately impacts your vote then too, right? Worshiping God is the way that Scripture declares as spirit and in truth. We want to do both. But that was last week. And if you know the first, that first verse I just showed you, you know Jesus actually continues on with it, with this statement. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Loving your neighbor as yourself is like the first commandment. Other translations even say like of equal importance or equally important. Which brings me to the question is, how do you do that? How do you do that? Like during this election time, I've learned a few ways not to, right? Like this is like one example I noticed. Like We installed a camera, got a couple pictures of people. Eventually they even added this electrified fence. If they even touch the sign, they're going to get... That, right? Or maybe this one. Quite obvious who I'm voting for. Anderson supporting Harris and Banovich supporting Trump. Rob put out a couple flags, and so I was like, well, I guess I got to get a couple more. And started putting yard signs, and when I would put more, he would. Signs and signs, right? But in all honesty, like, how do you really love your neighbor? Because it's hard for some of us to love our neighbor. I have some neighbors actually in the room right now. Um, and so I just started to think, like, because this is where my mind went this week. Like, what do I want them to do for me? So if that's you, like, and you're in the room right now, you could take note. Um, <laughs> but, like, the things I came up with is, like, borrow me tools and not expect them back for, like, a long time. Uh, bake us cookies, <laughs> Katie Pinch, um, or, and drop them off at our house. Uh, help me lift random heavy things that I always seem to be moving at my house. Keep an eye on my stuff while we're gone or when we're doing a big project, which we're redoing our garage floor right now, so this was last night, so I was hoping my neighbors were participating in helping with that. Uh, make sure nothing sketchy happens, like be friend friendly, express genuine interest and care in my kids' life and my life. And like, these are all great, right? And honestly, I think this is a very biblical way to approach loving your neighbor, like thinking about this, because it's how I want my neighbors to love me, so it's how I should love them. But in the Bible, the person who originally asked this question to Jesus keeps going. He, Jesus, he, he keeps going, and, he, he, and it's not the way like I did it, or he didn't ask the question that I did. He instead asked a different question. He asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? 
Who is my neighbor? My friends? Is it he who lives next to me? Is it my countryman? Is it my political party? Because when I think of neighbor, I think of neighborhoods, right? And let's be real, there are some neighborhoods like I want to associate with and live in, and some I don't. And although like in this housing market, it's harder to pick, but typically we can choose our neighborhood. Like to be real and vulnerable with you for a second, I've been a poor picker before of neighborhoods in the past. Like because, because I get emotional when I see the house. I get caught up in the house or the space or some special unique thing, and I'm like, I got to do it now, right? But neighbors are a big part of enjoying where you live. Call me bougie, but I like a neighbor who cuts their lawn and does lawn stripes. I'm into that right now. I like a neighbor who minds their own business. I like a neighbor who, this might offend you, so sorry if this is the case, but doesn't have spooky things in their yard because just driving by some things scare the bejeebers out of me or it's a conversation I have to have with my four-year-old every single day of why there looks like a person in a bag, all right? Just scary. Uh, I like a neighbor who, for lack of a better word, is like me. And this is, at first glance, my approach to loving my neighbor. I love people the way I want to be loved. And I generally think the people I'm supposed to show this love to is the people like me, who, you know, just get it. They just get it. They know how it works. They get it. Now, before we go any further with this, I want to present kind of this political science principle to you that I think is worth being aware of, especially if you're like me and you're thinking like me. Uh, It might ruffle some of your feathers. I don't know what political side this is like coming from, but either way, hang in there with me. But there's this principle or thing called Miles' Law, and it was developed years ago, and it goes something like this. It says, where you stand is where you sit. Meaning, where you stand on policies and desires and viewpoints is typically where you sit. As in, what kind of living you are in. Your upbringing, your neighborhood, your socioeconomic status, your city. A big-time pastor, Andy Stanley, he says it better this way. He says, our cultural context, where we sit, determines our perspective, where we stand. And so, this isn't scripture, You can disagree with this, but the reason I think this is worth sharing before we really do a deep dive in scripture is typically who you think your neighbor is, what you should do for them, what you think is best for them, what you think is best for all people, is typically, which those are things that typically form our vote, right? It comes typically from our cultural context or where we sit or where we live. It's not wrong for your vote to come from this, but with all that said, I want to pose a simple question. Could your neighbor also be someone outside of your context? Could your neighbor, who Jesus tells you to love as you love yourself, be outside of where you sit? Now, as you wrestle with that, let's see how Jesus actually answers this question, which what he does is he doesn't answer it directly. He answers it through a parable or a hypothetical short story about a trip. Now, if you've been coming to church or Center Point for a while, you know I'm personally a trip person. My family and I, we have a sprinter van that we love to travel in. We redid it as a camper with our three kids and a dog. So the six of us have done trips to Florida and Bentonville, Arkansas and Utah and the Wisconsin State Parks. We've done a couple trips out east. And we've slowed down a little bit this year because we have a six-month-old. But if we have a free weekend, we're going somewhere. That's kind of our general thought. Yeah, people always wonder, like, is this just easier for us? Because, like, we've done it so much. And to answer your question, no. It's not easier for us. There's a lot of work and time that goes into it. Uh, Like, because I'm a pretty type A person. So what that means is we have to budget for it. We have to plan. We have to pack for days. And it's exhausting, The exact leave time is is typically essential because although I am an adult grown man, I am completely controlled by my two-year-old's nap time. Uh, We have the snacks, we have the water, we have the gear, we even have a potty in the van. So instead of stopping every 10 minutes for the bathroom, it's like every 30 minutes, right? Um, The last thing we want, though, when we do a trip is an interruption to our plan and hopes for our little getaway. We don't want an interruption for that. 
which interruptions typically are something out of our control, something we can't determine. And honestly, we've, we've gotten things down to such a tight plan with such a big crew. Six people is pretty big for us, or with, including that dog. Um, the last thing I can handle is an interruption in something like that. Well, the story Jesus tells is about an 18-mile trip for someone who is walking or maybe taking a donkey from Jerusalem to Jericho. I mean, if, if you're a fit person, maybe you could do that in a day's time. If you have children, like five days' time, right? But all the same, like, it's a long trip, and it's one that isn't like, hey, I'm just going to run an errand to Jericho this afternoon. It's a very thought-out trip. It's a planned trip. And what happens in this story that Jesus shares is Jesus says a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now these robbers, like, they weren't just mean. As I was reading this, it's like, it's kind of awkward. Like, give us your clothes, and then they beat him. Like, this is weird. Like, why? But anyways, it says a person, what happens next is a person kind of, I want to say like, like me, a, a priest, I'm not a priest, but like a pastor comes by and sees this man beaten, and he does one of these, right? Like, kind of like walks away, like strays away, and goes to the other side and keeps going on his journey. Then it says a Levite, or a temple assistant, or how I want to talk about it is like a serious faith-oriented person, a church-going type of person, committed. They see this person, and they also do one of these, right? Because they're busy, and this is an interruption, they don't want to do the work. And honestly, it's kind of against the religious law as well, like to touch something that may be unclean of some sort, part of their ceremonial laws to the Jewish faith of God, of God's like original laws for us. When finally, though, it says the Samaritan comes by. Now, a Samaritan was the, the opposing nation of God's people. They were kind of seen as dirty, unclean, not accepted by God's people, not someone they should associate with. Uh, not, a, not a God follower. Historically, they were practicing Jews, uh, like God's people, but they decided to start mixing in idolatry with those, that faith as well and create other gods alongside him. Uh, they were also ethnically diverse and very different from God's people, which was just kind of off-putting for a lot of traditional God's people. And then from a lighter stance, they just weren't Israel. They weren't Israel, so like there's like this na national like kind of patriotism. Like they weren't as great as a, as as the nation of Israel in their eyes. Uh, God's people probably thought they were close-minded, unintelligent, immoral, and lazy. How did that get up there? Like that's what Republicans say about Democrats. Wait, that's what Democrats say about Republicans: close-minded, unintelligent, immoral, lazy, unpatriotic. Really? Are we like that to our neighbors? Do we think that? We're going to carry on, but I want you to think about that. The Samaritan, in our story, he comes by this man, and it says this. The Samaritan, as he traveled, came to, the man, uh, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Like this Samaritan helps and serves this person in multiple ways. And the story just ends there. But again, the story isn't really about a man being robbed and a man being cared for. It was a story Jesus shared to answer a question, which is, who is my neighbor? So Jesus finishes up the story by saying, which of these do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him, Jesus told him, or Jesus told them then, go and do likewise. So Jesus, he, what he does is he shows his neighbor could be anyone, an enemy, someone they disagree with, a crazy, immoral, closed-minded, unintelligent person, a person who you might have to let go of some of your maybe even ceremonial type laws or traditional laws for you, for you to care for. And the appropriate response to them is still loving and caring, or for the lack of a word, serving your neighbor, no matter who they are. This is fulfilling God's law. And not just a law, but one of the most important 
laws that is spoken right out of the mouth of Jesus. Meaning, if you're a Christian in the room right now, don't miss this. But if you are too tight on your pursuit of biblical living or your way or your rightness as a Christian and you're ostracizing or not caring for people, this story is showing us you've missed it. You've missed it. Because again, sure, God didn't like some of the things the Samaritans did. He doesn't like some of the things people do today. But to be a God follower and not love your neighbor is to miss what God's way of living is all about. Because Jesus, again, stated, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. As you think of her, you, are there some things you let surpass or take priority over your love for neighbor as yourself? Maybe because of some Christian things that you think your neighbor doesn't follow or advocate for. Because if so, we need to change. Our love and care and support of neighbor, it's what we are to do after loving God. So for today's sake and for our series, we're stating, I served others today. Because that is ultimately like what the Samaritan did, is he cared for, helped, and loved this person and showed it by serving. He didn't just have a feeling of mercy or sympathy, it was an action. And in our election season right now, I think it's easy for us to choose law or policy or party over love of neighbor as yourself. So to combat this, we can serve like the Samaritan did. We, we serve and love all as our neighbor. But as I was looking at this story, the story that I've heard countless times, and I'm sure if you've been in the church world for a while, you've heard a number of times too. You might even be thinking, this is kind of a fluffy, feel-good story and a pretty basic sermon, Aaron. I want something rich. I want something meaty from the text. I want you to expostulate a scripture more for me, Aaron. But I'll remind you, this was a story Jesus told an expert of the religious law. No offense, that ain't you. So this story is just fine for you and me today. But a couple of, of things that came over me as I was reflecting on this story of what the Samaritan didn't do that we ultimately justify doing is his agenda wasn't priority. He had margin and was willing to adapt to needs. He didn't see a person as a thing that he was just to donate to or find help for or send prayers and wishes. He did the physical work himself. His care wasn't just for a day. He cared for the future for this person. It was an ongoing service and relationship. Now, as I read these off to you, I'm going to admit, I am awful at all of these, all three of these. Maybe you're not, which is great for you. But, like, I think I am a fairly good Samaritan. Like, I give and I serve and I help. But when I run my life through the biblical example of the actual good Samaritan, I said, again, I am awful. I'm awful at these things. I am awful with fulfilling the things I just listed. Even with my friends, I'm awful with some of these things. Nonetheless, a neighbor, as Jesus describes. I'm bad with my friends because I, usually like my friends are the ones that pop up for me, and I, I, I'm bad with them because I tell myself, I don't got time. I'm busy. Someone else has got this. Someone else can take care of this. Like When I see or come across a, a Good Samaritan-like situation today, I think someone else will take care of this. Someone else has got this. Or maybe some organization can care for this. Some organization can fix this. They, they got the resources. Or even the government got this. They should take care of this. Which in our election season, so much of who we vote for is on who we think will care for those in need better. Like whether it's the veterans or the homeless or the single new mom or the hard worker that's just getting by or the refuge, refugee or the police or the working class or the marginalized or the children or the families, whatever. Like we want to place our vote in someone who will help people, right? I think both people on both political spectrums really want that. But what if we, as in you and me, instead of passing the buck or expecting someone else or some policy to do it, what if we actually served our neighbor or at least started to get in the habit of doing it, to have it become part of our life? And who knows, relied on that to become the ultimate solution for fixing some of our 
policy issues and not just placing a vote of confidence uh, that we do in November and then thinking, I've done my part. I did my part of caring for my neighbor. What if we really served? Do you think you can make a difference? You think it would make a difference? Call me naive, but I do. I do. My master's thesis in, in seminary was a study on how we, if when we truly become the church, serving others, you can diminish poverty. You can eradicate a lot of problems in the world. And if you're willing to come alongside me just for another 10 minutes or so here as I reflect on this parable, let's look at each of these briefly and then a bit on how to actually start being more like the Samaritan and getting into the practice of loving our neighbor better today. So the first one that like, I kind of mentioned was his agenda wasn't priority. He had margin in his day and time and was willing to adapt to needs. There was a survey that stated this, that uh, the average American has less than half an hour of free time per week. That just is ridiculous. It blows me away. I feel like that's what we think. Um, but it, I feel it. I feel like I don't have a lot of free time. And I think a lot of you do too. Yet these stats are also true. Like, the recent survey reveals a striking statistic on average Americans are, dedic are dedicated a substantial three hours and nine minutes each day to streaming digital media. Or this one's another one that's true. The average person spends about two hours and 24 minutes on social media. Like, okay. Now this isn't meant to be mean, like, shame on you. No more Facebook or Netflix, right? That's not what I'm saying. Because my wife would be, like, making me confess to you that I'm probably fitting some of those numbers or close to some of those numbers. But the truth is, we're busy people who like to fill our schedules. And then we don't have a lot of margin. And when the opportunity where a good Samaritan-like situation comes, we're like, ah, is my day off? Or, you know, like, I'm, I'm on vacation. Or, you know, I'm super tired. I'm just planning on doing some me time. Oh, it's been a long day. It's been a long week. It's been a hard month. It's been a really long year, right? It's kind of where we go with, with some of our statements. And then we let our agenda stay priority versus doing or responding the way Jesus showed us to show true love of neighbor. So solution number one, to be, more Samarit to be more like the Samaritan, is what if we simply carved out margin in our schedule? What if you cut 30 minutes of your social media time each day? That'd be so much time. Or one last show each night. Or you cut your reel and YouTube down, time down like half. Or you stopped your online shopping after 15 minutes. Or you woke up 30 minutes earlier. Or you stayed up just a bit later. I think if you did this, like, you first off, you first off would probably experience less of these situations, right? Let's be at his party in five minutes, okay. <clears throat> hey, man, what's going on? Hey, man, where you at? Party starts in like five minutes. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, I'm in the, I'm in the car right now, actually, so I'll be there soon. Okay, sweet. You remember to grab snacks, right? Oh, yeah. No, I got them right here, right next to me in the car. They're buckled in because I'm in the car. Okay, sweet. I'll see you soon. See you, man. <sighs> You'd be late less, right? You'd have more margin. But what if you actually gave yourself more margin each day so that you can have the longer talk with that person? You can help them out. You can stop by and pick them up and give them a ride. You can teach and give them wisdom that when they asked for it. You can run to the store and get the thing that they desperately need. This comes simply from giving yourself margin. The second thing that we notice in the story is he didn't see a person as a thing that he was just to donate to or to find help for or to send his prayers and wishes. He actually did the physical work. He did the work. He got dirty. I mean, he obviously had the funds, too, because he wasn't like, hey, my Uncle Buck's got a place to stay in town. Come on here. I'll let you stay there. Or I know a friend. Like, you can stay there. He ponied up a hotel for the guy. Cash and service. He served him and gave the cash. He paid the bill and did the work. I think we like to think, like, one is good enough, but this is showing us otherwise. Like, do you need to start doing both? Like, which one are you maybe neglecting? Okay, so this is going to sound super crabby and not pastoral at all, but I'm sharing it because it's real, 
and I need to confess it to sometimes get myself or kick myself in the butt to change. So, so here we go. But caring for those in need, like me physically doing it, the one-on-one caring is not really my thing. I'm not a fan. I think a lot of you can relate, but you probably don't like hearing your pastor say that. Either way, I know it needs to change for me. It has to change. Now, let me clarify here. I love talking about faith with others. I love talking about marriage or personal growth and struggles and how to overcome. I love that, especially so when it's one-on-one with people from church. But to be a neighbor like the Samaritan to a random person who I don't know and who doesn't really respect me or understand me, they're not part of the church, is a lot of work. It's listening. It's a lot of not judging. It's being patient. It's being uncomfortable. It's not being proud. It's biting my tongue. I would way rather complete a task, build something, fix something, write up a plan for a person, even front the bill for a person. But to physically care and be with someone, the one-on-one random person, is hard. But this, and this is why it needs to be my thing and also your thing, something we both do, is this one-on-one time helps you understand not just this person, but people. This one-on-one time helps you hear another perspective. This one-on-one reminds you that people have had harder breaks and struggles than you do or than you experience. And this one-on-one typically reminds you where you sit is not where everyone stands. This one-on-one care is where you get understanding of people in the world. If you aren't doing the one-on-one work, you need to change. Find margin in your day and start doing the work personally and physically. The last thing we kind of see from our story is he didn't get him a hotel. Uh, and uh, He didn't just get him a hotel and bandages and food and be like, good luck. You're on your own. But he cared about the future for him. It was an ongoing service. Now, there were future services offered to him. He's like, I'll, I'll pay the bill when I return. Continuous. Like, he set him up for success. That was his goal. It wasn't just uh, one deed and then gone. He wanted this injured person to be fully well and ready to take on the world again. Back then, what he basically did was like, hey, I'm leaving you my credit card, whatever you need to spend it, right? It's kind of like the modern version of it. Now, I'm not advising that. That would probably not be great. But what if what that neighbor in your life really needs is a phone number to text in the future when it gets hard, a continuous relationship? Or maybe it's a mentor or two that they know they can reach out to to learn from and and figure out how to overcome a situation when it arises. Maybe they need the book that you you can give them to help them process and and set set themselves up for success. Maybe it's something weekly that they need. Maybe it's something weekly, like church. Like, as we reflect on, like, these three things, like, a good Samaritan did and didn't do, like, we clearly see, like, he gave up some of his time, he, he did the work, he wanted to set this person up for success in the future, for specifically someone who was a different ethnicity, even. We don't know, like, any of the other details, like, a socioeconomic status, was, whether it was the same ideologies or political party, we don't know any of that. There's so, there's so many ways we can... We can look at this, though, and, and see the modeled actions and put them into practice for us. But the one I don't want you to miss, and the one I'm a bit shameless about sharing today, is you can do all of those things and be prepared to serve and in practice to reach all different types of neighbors through serving the church. Again, it's not limited to the church. It should be a part of your everyday life in all things and could be somewhere else. But what if church actually helped you get in the process of being a good Samaritan, to have margin, to do the work, to be a part of the ongoing solution for others? I mean, as a church, like we exist here, center point, to reach all people. All of the unchurched in Fond du Lac, all the unchurched people in Fond du Lac, that is our goal to reach. Even the people you don't like, even the ones you disagree with, even the ones you're uncomfortable with. We want to reach them. 
And if we're actually successful in our attempt at that, watch out. Because that means they're coming here on Sunday. And that's going to make your Sunday church a bit uncomfortable. One that will require you to love and serve someone different than you. But if our goal is to, is to reach all people of Fond du Lac and to help them take the next step in their relationship with God, and we are actually doing that work now, serving, the people of Centerpoint is absolutely going to force you to have margin, do the work, and be a part of the ongoing solution. So where are you serving right now? I only have a few moments left today, um, but it's going to get a bit harsh for just another minute or two, but it's for a purpose, so hang in there with me. If you can't create margin on Sunday, a day that is dedicated for the Lord to serve others, how are you going to find margin in your life to serve on Tuesday? You're not. If you can't do the hard work of loving someone one-on-one, -on -one, and they are at church even, how in the world are you going to love someone one-on-one -on -one that you randomly see at the grocery store? You're not. If you can't commit to a continuous investment of, of helping an organization exist and reach people by serving monthly, how in the world are you going to be able to help someone contribute to heal and get better and be set up for success in the long run? You're not. I get it. These are really harsh and very direct. But serving in the church is serving the people like you. It's serving the people you dislike but are still your neighbor, it's becoming someone who is in the mindset of serving. And we as a church want to help you start here at church so that you can ultimately be a good Samaritan out there. Here at Center Point, almost all of our ministries run off of once a month volunteer time for just one service of that Sunday. Have you started? Are you serving? For you, it could be hosting, like just greeting someone at the door, giving them a bulletin, the someone you like and the someone you dislike, you, ha you have to learn to greet them, giving them a bulletin, a warm welcome to know they're welcome here. For you, maybe it, it could be kids, helping with kids, uh, spending time with our juniors, which are preteens, or holding babies and littles, or teaching a young kid's class, maybe just assisting a kid's class, but serving monthly to get in the habit of caring for both kids you maybe love, and kids you're like... Rats, Johnny's here, right? But you're learning to love your neighbor and your neighbor's kids through it. Uh, we are a church that is drastically growing in this specific area and need kids' workers. It's the part of Fond du Lac that we're truly effective in reaching right now, both the ones you like and maybe the ones you dislike. We need you in this area. Another area could be like set up or tear down. Like we're a mobile church here. Uh, meaning we set up teardown each week. There's work that goes into making this museum space look good for us every week. We need your help with that. So that the person who, who's maybe like you or was like you at one point seeking for a place to worship, they can find something. They can come to a space that's set up and ready for them and they feel welcome and included. Lastly, it maybe, maybe it's hospitality, making coffee. Like nothing says you're being Samaritan-like than making coffee for the person you like and dislike, right? You're giving it to both. There are a ton more opportunities, but stop by our little ministry fair with the waving dudes out there. Talk to some of the people who want to help you find a place to start being in both the mindset and practice of being the neighbor. And P.S., like, if you don't like what you try or sign up for, no worries. Try something else. I love showing data like this, but there have been a ton of studies that show that you can literally receive health benefits from serving. In a study done by BMC Health, along with um, some, some people from the Harvard Research Group, um, they said serving others reduces early death by 22 to 44 percent from those who don't serve. Crazy. People who volunteer have a 29 percent lower risk of high blood pressure. They spend 38 percent fewer nights in the hospital over someone who doesn't serve. It also revealed that Volunteers benefit from reduced rates of depression and increased sense of life satisfaction when you serve. Is it by accident that God calls us to serve and love each other and then all of this extra stuff is granted and given to us? I think not. We are to love our neighbors, all people. We are to serve them as the good Samaritan did. 
And when we do this, we don't just make people's lives better in the moment, but we start to see where others sit, and it challenges us to think where we stand or should stand. Sometimes just in our actions, but sometimes in our programs, our policies, our viewpoints, and our votes. As I close us today, I hope you see that God wants you to love others just as much as you love him. And how you do that is you serve others, all people. I'm going to pray that we can get in the habit of that and be more like the Samaritan, both here at church and out there.